Welcome everyone. My name is Sierra Sanchez, webinar producer with CGLR. The webinar will begin shortly and will be recorded. Connect with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading on social media. On Facebook, like the page Campaign for GLR. On Twitter, follow the account at Reading by Third. And on LinkedIn, subscribe to us at Campaign for GLR. Please use hashtag Learning Tuesdays and tag us to tweet anything you learn from today's webinar, and we'll be sure to retweet. We encourage you to share your questions, reflections, and observations on social media. Once again, we would love to connect, so follow those pages that you see there, and the webinar will begin shortly. Okay, hello again. I have just a few housekeeping details before we get started. First, we'd love you to introduce yourself, so please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen to share your name, city, or state, and your organization. Be sure when responding to select both panelists and attendees so that we all know who is here. The webinar is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. A link to the recording as well as any resources and slides mentioned during the conversation will be shared in a follow-up email to all who registered. And finally, we'll be posting a brief on-screen evaluation during closing and highly encourage you to respond. This helps us with our commitment to continuous improvement. I'd also like to call your attention to our GLR Week 2023 Save the Date. GLR Week 2023 will be held from July 17th through 21st with the theme of Bright Spots and Silver Linings. The registration pages aren't set up yet. We do hope you'll mark your calendars and join us for this exciting, these exciting sessions. And before then, we do have other GLR Learning Tuesdays opportunities. Later this afternoon at 3 p.m., we have a partners webinar on third grade retention, a conversation about adult accountability and student outcomes. Next week on May 23rd, we'll have a conversation discussing showing up together, learning and attendance go hand in hand. And we'll invite you to wrap up the month of May with a session on opportunities and potential pitfalls, state expansion of education savings accounts. Registration and information for these sessions will be posted in the chat box now, and we hope you can join us. Joining you now is Sarah Torian, Chief Learning and Engagement Officer with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thank you so much, Sierra, and welcome everyone. We're so glad that you could all join us for today's conversation as we continue our focus on, on the importance of ensuring that all children have access to diverse books, this time zooming in on the important roles that funders can play in that area. In March, the Campaign for Grade Level Reading hosted a GLR Learning Tuesday session on this topic that featured the Diverse Books for All Coalition, launched last year to build a movement around books that reflect diverse experiences, including LGBTQIA, Native, people of color, gender diversity, people with disabilities, as well as ethnic, cultural, and religious minorities. In that section, Dr. Ioma Iruka, a research professor in public policy at the University of North Carolina, explained the importance of diverse books that allow children to see themselves, uh, see a part of themselves reflected in the pages of the books that they read, especially during those early years when their brains are, are developing, language is, in, language is forming, and their sense of self-identity, their sense of their self in the world is forming. If we want kids to fall in love with reading and to fall in love with books, I think we can all agree that we, we need to ensure that they have access to the books that they can connect with and that will inspire them to do so. Dr. Iruka also reminded us of the framing provided by Dr. Rudin Sim Sims Bishop, a professor emeritus at, at Ohio State University who described diverse books as mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. Mirrors that reflect the different aspects of a child's diversity in a positive manner, laying the foundation for positive self-identity. Windows that allow children to look through and see other worlds and other experiences that might be different from their own. And sliding glass doors that allow them to kind of pull back those windows and actually step into other worlds, other experiences, uh, building empathy, building understanding. 
I think we can all agree that all children need all three of these types of book experiences. Children who have lots of book mirrors um, also need access to books that can allow them to look through windows, move into sliding you know, through sliding glass doors to see and understand other experiences. While children for whom most available books are those windows are sliding glass doors also need ready access to books that can be their mirrors and reflect parts of their self-identity. In this moment in time, when there is exploding growth and challenges to books that reflect diverse experiences, with 1,200 documented demands to censor library books and resources just last year, it is more important than ever for philanthropy to act. And there are a wide range of actions that philanthropy can take, including supporting convening, research, advocacy, programs, and more. Actions that today's panelists are taking right now. And so I am honored to welcome and introduce our panelists for today, sharing just brief highlights of their bios, but I would encourage you all to learn more about their work and experiences using the uh, link that I just dropped in the chat box and that will also be shared in the follow-up email later on this week. First, I'd like to welcome Deborah Caldwell Stone back to the conversation after she joined us in March with her American Library Association hat on. Um, Deborah is the director of the ALA's Office for Intellectual Freedom, but also serves as the executive director of ALA's Freedom to Read Foundation and has worked closely with ALA members, library workers, and trustees for two decades to address a wide range of intellectual freedom issues, including book bans, internet censorship, and more. Welcome also to Melanie Claxton. Melanie is the uh, a senior program officer of the Claude Worthington Benedum Foundation, where she oversees the foundation's grants programs in education, which cover four counties in southwestern Pennsylvania, as well as the entire state of West Virginia. I'm also delighted to welcome Jennifer Stavrakis. Uh, Jennifer is the interim director and senior program officer for great learning at the William Penn Foundation in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where she's responsible for a portfolio of grants related to family engagement and advocacy. And I'm also honored to welcome and introduce Carla Thompson Payton. Carla serves as the Vice President for Program Strategy at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, where she supports the foundation's efforts to promote thriving children, working families, and equitable communities. She also serves on the board of First Book, the lead partner in the Diverse Books for All Coalition that I mentioned a moment ago, and which is an initiative of 27 different nonprofits and membership organizations that are seeking to leverage their aggregate buying power to influence the availability and the pricing of diverse books. And joining us to moderate today's conversation is Jacqueline Jones. From 2014 to 2022, Jacqueline served as president and CEO of the Foundation for Child Development. Um, she has also served in early childhood policy leadership positions at the state and federal level and as a senior research scientist with Educational Testing Service. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, really excited to hear what you have to share. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Jacqueline. Thank you, Sarah, and many thanks to the audience and panelists for joining us today to engage in conversation around the various roles that funders can play to ensure that children have access to culturally relevant and diverse books. So let's start by inviting each of our funder panelists to share a quick overview of the types of investments uh, you're making in this area and the geographical breadth of those investments. Uh, we're gonna have, we have lots of questions, so only about three or four minutes each, if you will. Deborah, let's start with you. You're a bit unique in this conversation. You represent a foundation that is embedded in a, in a national nonprofit, and you have a foot in each of those entities. So. How is ALA's Freedom to Read Foundation working in this area and why? Well, the Freedom to Read Foundation has a unique mission that complements the American Libraries Association's mission to assure access to diverse materials for all. And that's both litigation and professional development. And what we do is we work to defend the legal right to access diverse culturally relevant books in libraries and in classrooms across the country. Uh, 
Most recently, for example, we uh, supported students fighting an ethnic studies ban in Arizona by filing First Amendment and 14th Amendment briefs with the court that persuaded the judge to find that, in fact, the students' right to access books supporting their ethnic studies curriculum was a violation of their First and 14th Amendment rights. We continue to support our state chapters, uh, community organizations, citizens who are fighting censorship which is so frequently centered on removing books that deal with race, racism, gender identity, sexual orientation, and social justice under various stigma, stigmatizing rubrics like woke or you know, uh, critical race theory. Um, we're actively engaged on defending each families, each individual's freedom to read in the courts. But we also provide professional development to library workers and to educators across the country on these principles so that they're better prepared to defend access to books. For example, we work closely with the Tucker Foundation in Texas to provide professional development on access to information, First Amendment rights in the library to small rural libraries in Texas that would not otherwise have access to that education. And so through this work, we hope to defend that last bulwark for the freedom to read in our schools, in our communities, in our public libraries uh, by being active on these fronts. And um, we've found that our work is just increasing in the last few years. And we're just now about to engage in a number of new lawsuits defending both students and community access to diverse books. Thank you, Deborah. And Melanie, could you tell us about your work? Sure, I'd be happy to. I, um, it, it's a bit daunting following Deborah because we're not doing the same level of work, but I think hopefully um, through the conversation, you can kind of see the, the breadth of work and, and the role that philanthropy can play in, in a multitude of different ways. Um, and so I'll just start by sharing a little bit about the foundation itself uh, to ground the conversation today before I talk about one of our specific programs that we're uh, funding in West Virginia. And so for folks who might be unfamiliar with the Benenum Foundation, we have a very simple mission, which is to encourage human development in West Virginia and Southwestern Pennsylvania. And so what does that mean? That means we really look to kind of cultivate the leadership, the creativity, the innovation of individuals and communities and the design and of solutions to community needs. Um, and so we look at it from the prospect of not thinking about kind of these political or geographic boundaries, because we know that a lot of the issues that we're hoping to address are being faced um, just not within the locales that we serve, but being faced nationally, um, as demonstrated by today's conversation. Um, and we really try to do it in partnership and collaboration with public, private, and the nonprofit sector, really recognizing that it does take kind of this holistic community-based approach to advancing, whether that be innovative practices, programs, or policies in some of our, our key strategic areas. Um, and so to that end, in about December of 2019, the foundation was approaching its 75th anniversary and really kind of doing some introspective review of the work that we've done to date and really trying to understand, um, are there intentional ways that we can go big in terms of our investment in specific targeted areas of interest to the foundation? And so, our board of trustees at that time decided that they really wanted to focus on um, third grade reading as one of the areas to address to really understand how can we promote policies and practices that ensure students are reading on grade level by third grade. I think, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir a bit. I don't have to tell you why this is important. We all understand the importance of it or we wouldn't be here for today's conversation. Um, and so for us, we recognize that even though there might be some significant significant public investment that has been made over the years, as well as pre-existing programs, um, we're still seeing disparities amongst um, performance and proficiency across the state. So whether that be in certain regions or certain target populations, and our, our board of trustees recognized that this was an area that we really needed to focus on and be really intentional with in our giving. Um, and so that led us to really thinking about what can we do from birth till third grade to really support and advance literacy outcomes for students. Um, and so that kind of brings into the conversation about the access to culturally relevant and diverse books. And so one of our projects under that was really working with um, WVU School of Medicine 
uh, to, to write prescriptions for books, right? So thinking about how do we take a trusted resource, a community resource, somewhere where most um, parents and kids have to be, especially in those most formative years, and how can we leverage that relationship to promote the things that we know will advance positive outcomes for youth. And so that was one of our first initial kind of projects, what we call our phase one work. But the work that I really want to talk about is, is going a bit deeper and being intentional and recognizing that while those formative years are so important from birth to third grade, we can't stop there. So what is that continuation of the spectrum of supports look like for students? Um, and that led us to our program called Black Men Read. And so Black Men Read was an intentional effort to think about how do we get Black male community leaders, artists, storytellers in front of students to share not just their lived experiences, but to really talk about um, the importance of the representation in text. And so they're reading these texts that focus on young children, young Black children, adults, um, that are written by Black authors, right? And so this is a pilot project that we're currently working on in Jefferson County, West Virginia. And so it was really a kind of our, our first foray into being really intentional about increasing access to culturally relevant and diverse books. And we're looking at it as a way to, to kind of show proof of concept to think about how do we continue to scale these types of efforts um, statewide and, and, and beyond. We're going to hear much more about this, I'm sure. Uh, but let's let's hear. Thank you. Let's hear from what's going on at William Penn, and then we'll come back to uh, to get more in depth about these projects. Jennifer. Sure. So uh, William Penn Foundation is a 75-year-old family foundation based in Philadelphia, and the bulk of our grant making is in the city of Philadelphia. Um, we are part of our great learning portfolio or education portfolio as it is, um, really has two main goals. So one is kindergarten readiness and the second is reading on time by third grade. And so the bulk of our portfolio investments are really focused on kids zero to eight. And we support those goals through a variety of strategies, including high quality early childhood education and K-3 literacy supports, literacy rich environments. And by that, we mean how do we infuse literacy in all of those spaces that aren't in the home and aren't in school. So, um, barbershops, grocery stores, parks. Um, we also have a family engagement portfolio and we also support advocacy for more public investment in quality pre-K, home visiting and K-12 education. Um, one of the long-term investments that we've made has been our investment in our grade level read campaign, Read by Four. Um, and you know, those citywide investments um, and the 120 plus partners that are part of Read by Four have really in helped inform a lot of our grant making, the conversations that happen at that table, the needs that have arisen because of those partner conversations. So um, you'll hear more about these investments as we go on in the conversation, but you've made uh, investments to learn more about book distribution efforts in Philadelphia. Um, we funded advocacy for Reach Out and Read so that that can be publicly supported and sustainable over the long term in Pennsylvania. Um, and we also recently funded a, part, a project in partnership with Read by Fourth and Fourth Book to increase, in First Book, to increase the number of diverse books that are being distributed by organizations across Philadelphia. Um, and those are organizations that provide free books to children. Great, thanks. And Carla, please tell us about Kellogg's investments. Sure, so thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation has been in existence for 90 years, well over 90 years. And we invest across all 50 states and in Mexico and Haiti. And then we have some legacy work that we're doing in South Africa, Costa Rica, and then some new communities that we're funding through our newest initiative, Racial Equity 2030. So when we think about children, we think about children as from the families that they have and the families that reside in the communities. And so for us, all of our work is really centering around what is that ecosystem that sur surrounds children? Who are the key players within a child's life and that needs to support them that we need to support through our grant making? For the, as long as 
most of us know the Kellogg Foundation. We've been a big funder in early childhood education and looking at it from a systemic approach, both from what happens at home and what happens in the classroom, but also what happens in state and federal systems as it supports young children. And we all know that reading is fundamental, which is why early childhood was the pillar that we chose to focus on in the education continuum, because we much rather work on prevention than intervention. And so for us, not only do we invest in collaboratives around getting books in front of children, but we're also thinking about funding streams that can support access. We're thinking about library systems. We're thinking about publishers. We're thinking about ways in which we can break down and dismantle the barriers that do not allow for families to be able to readily access books. But most importantly, how can we ensure that books are available that reflect the families that want to read them and so that children can see themselves in that. And so for us, not only do we do our grant making, but we also encourage every member of our staff to invest their time in something that's meaningful to them, which is why I'm also volunteering and serving on the board of First Book, because books are incredibly important. And so what we wanted to do was make sure that not only do folks see us as a good funder in this space, but they also see us as a good planner and a good participant and helping to change the narratives around books around access to books, around all of the systems that are necessary to ensure that children continue to be able to read and thrive. Thank you so much. So as I listen, your efforts represent a variety of approaches that funders can play to ensure access to diverse books for all children. I'd love to hear a little more about what motivated your foundations to engage in this work. Sure. What, why did you see sort of access to culturally relevant books as being aligned with and or in support of your goals for children's learning and development? And if you did so, uh, sort of give us some sense of the challenges of, of this work. Uh, Carla, let's, can, let's stay with you and, uh, and, and let's see if you can address some of those. Sure. So in 2007, the Kellogg Board of Trustees committed to becoming an anti-racist organization and ensuring that in all of our work, three pillars showed up, which we consider to be the Kellogg DNA, racial equity, community engagement, and leadership. And all three of those things show up in everything that we do. And so for us, because of the deep commitment to early childhood education and recognizing the importance of the early literacy skills, it was us fulfilling our DNA in this grant making. So we didn't have a risk. There was a risk for us not to do it because then we wouldn't be walking the walk that we want to see happen across this ecosystem of early childhood education. And because we believe so deeply in racial equity, we wanted books to reflect the children who were reading them. We wanted teaching staff to feel comfortable and prepared so that they can teach reading to young children because we also recognize that there was a huge deficit. Not everyone can teach reading as much as we'd like to, as much as I as a parent of a five-year-old think I have some skills. I also recognize that it's both at home and in school and in community that children build these skills. And so we wanted to make sure that in our funding investment, that we were looking at it from those three lenses, what's happening at home, what's happening in school, and what's happening in the greater community. And that's why we've decided to invest in the way that we're doing. So there's not one particular part of the access pipeline that we focus on. We focus on the entire access pipeline. And wherever there's an opportunity, that's where we want to partner with other funders and other organizations working in this space to affect that change. Great. Deborah, could you address the, the, the why, the motivation that led you guys to do this work? Well, the Freedom to Read Foundation has long been committed to assuring access to good library services for all and to making sure that everyone should be able to find books that reflect their lives and experiences on the shelves of those libraries without anyone interfering with that for whatever reason. And the rising effort to target and stigmatize and remove books dealing with um, race, 
gender identity, sexual orientation in the last few years has caused us to redouble our efforts to not only defend individuals and families' ability to access books in libraries, but to provide opportunities and to defend the ability of library workers to provide those books to the community, uh, whether it's through a school library or in a public library. And as I mentioned, so a lot of that has taken place in the courtroom um, or working with those in the courtroom to defend that access. Um, we're grounded in the right of patrons, families, parents to access the books they want to find and need. And we're hearing over and over again, the importance of finding books that are culturally relevant, that reflect the lives and experiences of those who've been traditionally marginalized in society. So we've really doubled down on our efforts to provide the resources necessary to those, both providing access to those books, defending their ability to give that access to individuals um, and to make sure that everyone has the tools they need to uh, make sure that those books are available to all. Great. Melanie? Yeah, so thank you. Um, and I'll just start by sharing some data, right? So when you ask about the why, I think it's important to understand the context in which some of our students are learning. And so when you look at West Virginia and you think about the overall um, population of African-American individuals or individuals that identify as African-American, we're talking about three or 4% of the population, right? Um, it's only slightly higher in the county in which we're serving, which is about 6.5%. And then when you take all of that into consideration and then look at um, access to African-American educators, specifically black males, now we're talking about less than 1% of the population. And so we knew looking at this data that something had to be done, right? So we had to figure out, are there opportunities for us to begin to start mitigating the inability of our school systems to, to attract diverse teachers? Um, but more importantly, thinking about for those, even if, if it's a smaller subset of the population, but thinking about those students who don't see their narratives represented in the day-to-day -day lives of the curriculum and their learning experience, right? So they're really existing in a space where a lot of the curriculum offerings are currently predominantly centered on European white narratives. And so for us, we, we recognize in the need to serve all kids, we have to make sure that we're actually being inclusive of all students um, in the way that we're approaching their educational experience and their journey. Um, and while I don't necessarily think that for us, this work was as much of a risk as much as it is kind of countering the, the traditional way and approach to um, the way that we think about education holistically. Um, it really was an opportunity for us to just make sure we were being intentional about saying that if we we're serving all kids that they see themselves in this work. Um, but kind of the flip of just making sure that students who do identify as African American see themselves reflected in the text that they're reviewing was the importance for us knowing that for a lot of our students they were probably not gonna come in contact with someone from a different racial identity than them. And so what role could we play in ensuring that as they're understanding and beginning to develop their own identities and their understanding of the world at large, that it really is a, a comprehensive approach and look at the world uh, and a, a thoughtful approach and look at the world around them um, in a way that they may not have been able to access otherwise. So we view it from the perspective of it's extremely important for everyone to see themselves reflected in text, but it's also important for them to be able to understand and learn about others through the incorporation of text. Thank you. And Jen? Sure. So um, we, under our family engagement strategy, uh, made an investment in 2018 to open IDEO to help us design and implement the Early Childhood Book Challenge. And the goal of the challenge was to source an original story that would inspire and model for caregivers ways they could support their child's early learning, but also being an engaging story for young children. Um, and the book was meant through stories and illustrations to reflect the lived urban experience, especially for Philadelphia families. You know, a lot of books that organizations are able to get a hold of to distribute for free um, are lots of farm animal books um, or things that are happening in white picket fence kind of homes. And they weren't really reflecting um, the lived urban experience that happens in Philadelphia. So we wanted to make sure that there were row houses and public transportation and other things that looked like um, what was happening for families. Um, so 
I think that there are links in the um, chat about our book. I have the book here. Um, but when we got into this project, um, we knew nothing. <laughs> we knew less than nothing. And same with Open IDEO about book development, about illustration, about the publishing industry. Um, I feel like I spent two years just drinking from a fire hose, trying to get what seemed like a great idea to the finish line. Um, we ended up with a beautiful book that met our criteria. Um, and it was also published in four bilingual versions reflecting um, you know, the four most popular languages spoken in Philadelphia. And that was something that was of great importance to our book selection committee, but also something that we'd heard over and over again from our home libraries work with the three by fourth was how hard it was to get a hold of bilingual books. Um, we provided funding to Lee and Lowe to publish 25,000 copies for free in Philadelphia, but Lee and Lowe also published the book themselves under their own banner. Um, I learned so much from that partnership with Lee and Lowe about the systemic issues that keep diverse books and bilingual books off of shelves, what drives up the price point for those books, what people choose to publish and don't publish. Um, and so that experience and the ongoing challenges that I knew were facing the organizations in Philadelphia who do book distribution challenge uh, really ignited our, our most recent investment in this book wish project that you'll hear a little bit more about. In a um, but Jacqueline, you're muted. <laughs> I was so hoping that I would go through some event uh, and not have someone tell me you're on mute, but okay, it, it didn't happen. So uh, I, this is my typical thing. It'll happen again, I'm sure. Uh, I, I was referring to the research that that some of you have done. Jen and Deborah, both of you have invested in research as part of your work in this area. So could you tell us a bit about the research your foundation has supported and made use of uh, as as you begin this effort, um, and and Jen, why don't we just keep going with you because you've done this, and then we'll go to Deborah and see if if anyone else has a anything they want to chime in about. Jen, sure. Um, in 2017, the foundation uh, made a grant to Susan Newman at NYU um, to examine the book distribution efforts that were happening in Philadelphia. So as Read by Fourth formed and the Home Libraries um, Table formed. There were about 30 plus organizations who were distributing free books in Philadelphia, but there had been no data gathered in terms of who was who was giving books where to what ages. Um, and also no one, there wasn't a lot of examination about what kinds of books were being given away. Did they match what families wanted to see in books? Um, and so Susan did a geographic analysis of where books were being distributed and also did focus groups with families to try to understand how books were being used in homes. Um, the feedback from the focus groups led to the creation of a tip sheet for Read by Fourth partners about what families wanted in books, including diverse and multilingual books, books with fewer words and bolder images, and books that supported school readiness. Um, and really those tips um, and I think there's a link here for a blog post about it, but those have really um, become a guide for all of the organizations who are um, purchasing or acquiring books for distribution in Philly. Um, and the analysis geographically really demonstrated in the beginning that we had a book desert in North Philadelphia, which allowed um, Read by Fourth and partner organizations to work really quickly to make introductions and build partnerships with new organizations. Um, Read by Fourth has um, replicated Susan Newman's research questions into a quarterly survey of campaign partners um, so that we continue to track that data and understand what distribution efforts are looking like. And it's led to the identification of new needs and opportunities in the city, which partners continue to work together to address. Thank you. Deborah, could you tell us a bit about the research efforts that you guys have engaged in? Well, the Freedom to Read Foundation relies heavily on its partnerships with other organizations to amplify its work and messaging. And so we've partnered with uh, the initiative United Against Book Bans, uh, which is part of ALA, 
to do research into the importance of having diverse reading materials available to improve educational outcomes. That white paper, which brings together two decades of research in this area across both uh, library, academia, educational academia, is available through a website for individuals to use to provide information about the importance of having these books. It's called Empowered by Reading. And it's really an advocacy tool because we find that often we have advocacy groups claiming that the diverse books harm students. And instead, we wanted to show instead that in fact, they improve educational outcomes. We've also engaged uh, as in regards to advocacy in public opinion polling that gives us the numbers to know that we understand that we have the, the support of the majority of individuals out there, parents, voters, community members, who disagree with the idea that censorship is a tool for uh, limiting access to books. Um, and we use that to fine tune messaging and advocacy that we use, that our partners use across the book ec ecosystem, across the library ecosystem. Um, and, as, and of course, consistent with our main mission, we maintain active legal research materials available that address rising issues in the courts that are threatening access to diverse books in classrooms and libraries across the country with a particular focus these days on discriminatory actions that are focused on discriminating on the basis of race, gender, or, or sexual orientation, which has become more important these days. Great. Uh I just want to give a moment for if Carla or Melanie have anything to chime in on the use of research. Sure, I do, wearing my other hat as a board member, first book, want to talk about the inaugural Diverse Books Impact Study that was launched in December 2022, and it will go until May 2023. And it's going to give us a sense of the impact of inclusionary books within the classroom and both getting feedback from teachers and students around what the what access to diverse books means to them and so looking for that report to come out later in the summer but something that will be real actionable real-time data that we can use in our conversations around the importance for funding in this space oh, could you tell us the name of that study just again in case I'm sure can... it's the diverse books impact study First books impact study. Great. And Melanie, anything? Um, so while we're not doing direct research in this space, uh, similar to what Carla mentioned, we are doing and we'll be conducting an evaluation of the program to really understand the impact from the um, perspective of all the key stakeholders, including both the youth, the educators, as well as the community um, providers or community partners that come into the space to really figure out how can we continue to enhance and promote opportunities, opportunities like this moving forward. Great. You know, as, as I listen to you, I, I think this work involves a lot more than just distributing books. So Carla, you may mention, you use the term ecosystem. Uh, previously, how do, how do you guys envision the ecosystem of this work? And Melanie, I'm gonna start with you. How do you see your foundation fit? What's their fit within that ecosystem? So uh, as you mentioned, we've, we've used that terminology, I think a couple of times throughout today's conversation, right? And there's so many different um, kind of individuals and systems that make up this ecosystem that we're talking about from our educators to our young learners to the authors of these, these texts to publishers, the policymakers that either create policy that can be helpful or harmful to some of these initiatives that we're discussing, um, as well as just the accessibility of the content and the intentionality of the content um, and the environments in which youth are learning to those that are financing this work. And so it's a, 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 a really wide breadth of folks um, and different activities that are happening in this space. But it isn't just, I think, looking at it from the lens of one element of this, which is just um, access to books, right? So it's thinking about like, what's the breadth? Like, what is what is the what are the variety of options that exist currently? Um, where can students access them, even if they can't access them? Um, a lot of times, I like to to say the terminology that um, access is an equity, right? So just in, increasing the number of doesn't mean that we're really getting to those who could use and benefit from this the most. Um, and so I think about the role of philanthropy in this, and, and to me, there's a component of this that focuses on, yes, it's important to just increase the access 
to these books for kids, but there's more about like, how are we integrating this into like kind of their lived experiences as well as their learning experiences, right? How is this being embedded into the curriculum? And so for us, it isn't just saying that, yes, now you have a book that you can take home, grow your library, which we know is valuable and important, um, but you see this reflected in, in all of your course content. This, is, this becomes a part of your learning experience. And so to that end, beyond just providing the physical books themselves, we do a lot of work around teacher quality. That's one of our primary strategic initiatives within the foundation. And so under that um, is really thinking about how are we working with teachers to create content that is more culturally relevant and engaging um, and leveraging these texts in that way, in that space to continue to provide unique learning opportunities and experiences for youth. Jennifer, how do you see this ecosystem and, and the William Penn Foundation's fit within it? Yeah, so um, again, based on that experience with Lee and Lowe, I think it really led us to think about what were the leverage points in those systems to improve access and um, what did that mean for us as a regional funder? Um, so obviously our first priority is always um, families in Philadelphia. And um, we had conversations with First Book about their national goals a couple of years ago, which turned into the Diverse Books for All um, Coalition. Um, and thank you to Kella for funding that. Um, but as a local funder, we couldn't be the lead in that national effort. And so we really had to think about how can we make an investment to address systemic issues about sourcing diverse books for Philadelphia. Um, and so that led our home libraries work group and first book to co-develop a project called Philly Book Wish, um, where organizations can apply for awards up to $2,000 to purchase books from first book stories for all book lists. Um, and it's really meant to stretch the existing budgets um, because we know that diverse books have a higher price point. And so how do we get more of the books that are being distributed, a higher percentage of them to be diverse books that match the communities that the books are being distributed to? Um, we also, there's money built into this grant to deal with shipping and storage, which is often an issue for smaller organizations as well who are doing book distribution. So to date in the first year, $121,000 has been distributed to 87 organizations who purchased over 24,000 first books. Um, first book and read by fourth are collecting qualitative and quantitative data to measure the impact of the project over the next few years. And we're really hoping that this model, it can be a model for other communities to think about how they can bulk purchase books and show publishers that there is a demand for these types of books. Thank you. And Carla, what, what's Kellogg's take on this ecosystem? For us, you know, we work in so many communities and we work with so many outstanding organizations. We saw our role in this space by helping to create more collaborative spaces for groups to work together, really thinking about how we could put our collective power together for action as well as impact. And so the space that we've been operating in most recently, you know, we funded almost every organization that's part of the first book coalition individually, but we also recognize that creating time and space for groups to come together to talk about what they're doing, to see where the synergy is, to see where there's opportunity was equally important. And over the pandemic, we had a greater recognition for helping to create those spaces because it's not something that's always afforded to every organization. And so we wanted to be in that network building, facilitation, collaboration, part of the ecosystem, recognizing that we didn't have the direct relationships with the publishers. We don't have the direct relationships with the authors, but we work with amazing organizations that do. And if they have room and time and space to come together and think about it holistically, we could actually see action in this lifetime. The convening power of philanthropy mm -hmm. is very Absolutely. powerful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Deborah? Well, Freedom to Read Foundation has a unique niche in the library ecosystem. And so we play to that strength um, by using our ability to do professional development, 
uh, support librarians and educators doing the work of getting books in the hands and recognizing truly that um, equal access is an equitable access. Um, to that end, last summer, we actually sponsored a symposium for library workers called the intersection of intellectual freedom and social justice to amplify the message of the importance that intellectual freedom isn't just defending the First Amendment right to read, but it's also making sure that each individual reader, every student, every young person has access to books that are relevant to their lives and experiences, and that it's the role of the library to make those books available. And so we had this day and a half symposium examining the issue of both the freedom to read and the need to support social justice across the library ecosystem. And then working in partnerships with the publishers, the authors that make the work of libraries possible on a regular basis. We are forming coalitions regularly, working regularly with groups like We Need Diverse Books, the Diverse Book Coalition, um, the Bam Book Suite Coalition. It's really uh, an essential part of our work to both support and convene these conversations um, uh, across the whole, I would call the book ecosystem that we work with as library workers and supporters of libraries. As we talk about ecosystems, I'm hearing a lot about partnerships, Deborah, you just mentioned partnerships. So, so hang, hang in there with us, Deborah, and, and, and let's think about the role that partnerships have played in the development and implementation of your investments and maybe in the role of bringing to scale. So Deborah, why don't you start us off and with that thought about partnerships? Well, certainly partnerships allow us to scale up our influence and our ability to pursue our mission in support of the right to read and uh, uh, the right of library workers to make these books available to their communities. Um, we work with in partnership with ALA state chapters, which places us in all 50 states. The Unite Against Book Bans campaign is a grassroots initiative that we're a national partner with. And there are over 80 national partners comprised of educators, publishers, writers, um, uh, civil society groups, diverse book coalitions um, that are all working together to push against this toxic narrative to amplify advocacy at the grassroots to defend the freedom to read and access diverse books. Um, we work with the BAM Books Week Coalition. That's actually been a longstanding partnership with the National Coalition of Teachers of English, the National Coalition Against Censorship, the Authors Guild, the National Book Foundation, other organizations um, to highlight the fact that despite the fact that we live in a country that supports the freedom to read through the First Amendment and other um, commitments that we still have censorship bad censorship going on in schools and libraries across the country and that there's a need to invest in initiatives that push against those narratives that support those fighting for the freedom to read and the fight freedom to access diverse books. And um, without those partners, we would be nowhere. You know, we really need our partners to be with us in this fight and we cultivate those relationships. Um, uh, and make sure that we're always there on the front lines with our partners. Great, thanks. Melanie, you have some thoughts around partnerships? Absolutely. So I'll just say the Black Man Read Project was born out of partnerships, right? And so this came to us because um, we had the Jefferson County School District Cultural Unity and Equity Department that saw a need. The Black Teachers Association of Jefferson County saw a need. Um, as well as the staff and students for the Contemporary Theater Studies Program at Shepherd University, which is the local university um, in that part of the state. And so all of these folks came together because they recognized there was a community need that was not being met to think about how could they collectively um, be creative and innovative in addressing that particular gap for students. And so partnerships are what are basically essential to all of the work that we do at the foundation, but especially um, when we're talking about this specific initiative around um, ensuring that our students had access to strong role models um, that could provide this scholastic encouragement and engagement, and then also having that strong community tie-in. And so for us at the foundation, um, given the fact that we serve an entire state, 
we often are reliant on folks um, at the community level to help inform our strategy and thinking. And so for us, we've been able to establish some additional partnerships with the Rural Arts Collaborative, which also has a, a breadth of services um, and ensures that there's access to arts integrated work across curriculum in the state of West Virginia. And they brought this project to us. And so I think for us, we, we see partnerships as essential to any um, strong collective action and the ability to mobilize communities. And what has happened as a part of this is now we're beginning to build additional advocates for the work. So now the educators who are a part of this are being able to advocate, not just at a school level, but at a district level. And now we're hoping at a county level as we continue to expand this work um, and then bringing together our counties at one point to then start thinking about what is that collective agenda look like at the state level, right? And so thinking about how do we start in a more kind of localized grassroots way with folks who are really tied to and connected to the community and have an essential stake in the success of students and youth um, and bringing that all the way up to, to really starting to think about what is like state level policy change look like. Banding your partnership network, really interesting. Jennifer? Yeah. Um, as I've said, I think in every question I've mentioned, read by fourth in our home libraries work group. Um, I've joked that it's the most functional work group I've ever sat in in my life. Um, they are um, 30 plus organizations who are deeply tapped into the communities that they serve and are really motivated by being at the table together and being nice and share information. And so, so much of what we've learned about the need in Philadelphia um, and some of the systemic issues have come from that group. Um, in addition to them, uh, like I said, Lee and Lowe, I learned so much through that process and continue to call them when I have questions or issues come up. And I'm trying to understand, again, some of those systemic issues that I think, I think there's a lack of information about why a diverse book or a multilingual book might cost three, four, five, ten dollars more per book than, you know, Barbie's Dream House, <laughs> you know, book that is out there. And so um, trying to understand those issues and, and uh, what that means. Our Reach Out Maine in Philadelphia, which is under Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, is a huge network and again has helped us inform what the language needs are. Um, and the books that they're buying for their families um, through that program. Uh, I also want to mention Parent Child Plus, which is a national um, evidence-based home visiting program. Um, they've been doing a series called Mirrors, Win Mirrors Windows, and Doors. Um, and through that work and their own work at looking at the books they sourced for families, um, they did an anti-bias book, um, an anti-bias tip sheet, um, which I think um, I provided for the chat, but they've also been training organizations, including organizations in Philadelphia of how to go through that process to review the books that you're currently buying and see if they are um, anti-bias, anti-racist, um, and really dig a little bit deeper about what it is that you're distributing. So, um, there's already been a handful of organizations trained in that in Philadelphia, and I, there seems to be demand for more of that. Nice. Carla? Sure, great. So partnership is the only way the Kellogg Foundation wants to move forward because we recognize that coming together has a much greater impact than what we could do on our own with our own individual resources and the communities that we serve. And so that's why we, you know, funded first book to build the diverse books coalition. And now that's 38 organizations strong after seven months. So fantastic level of partnership and folks coming together to think through how do we get books in front of children, families, and communities. But we're also looking at funding partnerships, which we're exploring right now around teacher preparation. How can we help teachers build their skills in teaching reading in the classroom? What are the things that they feel they need in order to be successful in helping children see literacy, emerge themselves in literacy? We're also thinking about the various platforms. Not, not everything is a book in hand. Sometimes it's a digital platform. How do we have access for families to be able to access books in multiple languages through a digital media? 
as well as some of the creative ways folks have begun to begin presenting ideas around how they see literacy shifting and changing in the future and what will remain the same and what will be slightly different. And so for us, it's conversations. It's having those partnerships come forward. It's partnering with local foundations, par partnering with huge library systems, it's partnering with universities, it's partnering with public policy advocates, it's partnering with public systems, really thinking through how can we do better to ch by children and how can we ensure that their access to literacy is not because they don't have access to materials that would help them gain that skill. You know, you've all made reference at some point to the current uh, social context in which we're living. Uh, these culture wars are very much in the news, they're a reality. And so I'm wondering from, from each of your perspectives, what are you learning as you do this work, given the particular context in which we find ourselves? Carla, why don't you just... Sure. We're learning that narrative matters and that who the messengers are are incredibly important. And for us, we're taking an education stance. We're trying to inform folks what is diverse books, what are what's diversity, what's racial equity, and what it's not. And you know, in many of the communities that we work, you know, you hear those trigger words that you hear in the media around critical race theory and you know being woke is someone's top of the conversation. And when you go into community and you ask folks, so what is this? You know, how, where, where do you fall in that line of the conversation? Many of the communities that we serve are not able to say what it is outside of what they're hearing in the media. So for us, it's really that education vein, talking about why it's important for kids to see themselves in liter literature, why it's important for kids to be able to experience other parts of the world or other ways of living that they don't see in their day to day. It's reminding folks that most children live within a five block radius and very few ever have an opportunity to go outside of that space. How can you build the imagination? How can you tap into creativity? And really looking at it from an opportunity vantage point, less of a risk and a danger standpoint. And so working with our communications team, working with our communities, really thinking about what is the language that resonates with folks on either side of the political spectrum around what is it they want for their children, their hopes, their aspirations, and helping them map words back what it would take to get their child there. And using those conversations to be able to help to move away from some of the more negative conversations that we've all seen over the past couple of years. Sounds like a lot of listening and framing and- uh, Absolutely. And, and Deborah, this is right up your alley. So what have, what have you been learning? Well, I have to echo Carla. We've been learning a lot about reaching out to different audiences, understanding what messages work best with those different audiences. Um, and really playing on the idea of fairness and equity in a way that many people will hear. We, you know, we do trust the work we've done, the research we've done with audiences. And uh, what I'm heartened by is when people do understand the issues at stake, what is the threat to access to information, the unfairness to members of the other members of the community, uh, people get it and they will support access to diverse books and turn away policy initiatives, legislative initiatives in their communities that are threatening that access. So it's both a good news and bad news things. I've seen some of the worst you could ever imagine targeting librarians, educators, activists in this area, but I've also seen really great things come out of communities that I did not expect to see it. Um, so it's always a constant learning experience, but I just have to say that the work is always going to be there on really countering the negative narratives and providing a substitute narrative. And that includes working with the press, which is really, uh, we've begun working with them to push back against some of the, they'll parrot headlines, they'll parrot stigmatization of these books in the headlines without questioning that. Um, and we're working very closely with press uh, representatives right now to counter that, that, F, uh, that, um, that impulse to simply parrot um, uh, false claims in headlines where people might not go beyond the looking at the education headlines. of the press, if you will. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Melanie? 
what what are your thoughts on these culture wars we're in and, and the yeah. impact of your work? Yeah, so I echo the thoughts of my colleagues here, and I, I'll try not to repeat anything that they've stated, but um, I guess what I've learned is it isn't so much new as much as it's been reinforced through this process, which is uh, buy-in is important. So we know that having the right people at the table to have these conversations engage in this work is necessary. And that, you know, if we had one entity trying to come into the school system and dictate how they were operating, that this wouldn't have been able to happen, right? And so making sure that the, the folks that are going to be impacted by this have a seat at the table and feel like they are a part of the planning and implementation of this work and, are, and can really own it and take responsibility for it is extremely important. Um, as well as the, the messenger matters. Uh, I think we can all come in with a, all of our research and, and say, here are all the things that we know are good and you should be doing. But I, once again, I'm not on the ground doing the work. And so um, it's really important to make sure we have those trusted folks who are bought into this, understand the value of this and can effectively communi back, communicate that back to their communities as a part of this process. Um, and then, you know, as we think about like more long-term systemic change, policy level change, um, it's really important to understand what does this look like in the local context. And so what I mean by that is there are a lot of really great initiatives and you can come into West Virginia and say, this is really effective in Ohio, really effective in Florida. And our, our, our state reps will say, well, that's not West Virginia, right? And so for us, I think when we took this approach, we were so intentional about making sure we were piloting something that we knew was based in the evidence, based in the research, was effective practice, but we were doing it um, with respect to the local context. So now we can say we have West Virginia data about how this impacts West Virginia kids around why this is so important for you all to take action because these are the, those who you are committed to serving um, and this is what they need and this is what we're, they're telling you is an effective practice and it's gonna benefit them most. And so I think when I think about this process, that's really what we've been able to kind of learn and, and, and um, really understand from the work. Context is everything, really. Jennifer? Sure. Um, we have lots of problems in Philadelphia. Thankfully, um, this has not been one of them. We are an incredibly diverse um, city, and so the pushback around diverse books has not happened, although it's certainly popping up in communities all around Pennsylvania. Um, but we do have another equity issue, which is around lack of public access to books and diverse books for kids. And so um, COVID dramatically cut library hours across the city. And because of staffing issues, those hours have not come back. And so lots of neighborhood libraries aren't open in the evenings. They're not open on weekends, sometimes not even fully during the day. A dramatically underfunded school system. And most of them are lacking school libraries at this point. And so, for us in Read by Fourth right now, we're really trying to figure out what the leverage point is, how we can make a difference in, in ensuring that there's public access ongoing to books. So this has been really fun for me, I hope for you, but I see that there are, there's a lot of conversation going on and, and there are questions that people are raising. So Sarah, are you going to lead us through some of the questions? I just want to before we do anything, thank the panelists uh, for sharing your experiences and what you found. Um, and I think, are we doing Q&A now? Because I just want to make sure we have time so that we can answer questions. It seems to be a lot of activity going on. Um, yes, the panelists have uh, elicited lots of feedback and engagement in both the chat and the Q&A box. So happy to share a few of those um, with you all now before we wrap up today's conversation. But thank you so much, Jacqueline, for moderating this amazing conversation. Really appreciate it and hope you'll stay around for the remainder of it. Um, one question we had um, was that kind of recognizing the shifts in how we read that's been happening over uh, the past several years with kind of uh, increase in the use of uh, electronic devices, digital books. Um, someone asked a question of, given the recent US Census recently reporting that 80% of all families with children under the age of five have tablets at home, and including 60% of low-income families, what are your thoughts about um, the place for access to digital books and book equity as a part of 
the commitment that all of you have been talking about in terms of providing access to those amazing books that I think are really wonderful for children to actually touch and feel and turn pages. Um, how are you all um, kind of utilizing digital access, I guess, or digital books as a part of your work around um, diverse book access? Um, our Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has done some research about this difference between reading um, digitally versus, um, you know, what you get out of in hand. And obviously, because parents are often holding their children when they're going through a book, you know, there's there's a lot to be gained from that physical tactile experience of having a book. However, the reality is parents and kids are on um you know, tablets and phones constantly. And so um, we made an investment last year, Children's Hospital is convening families to help work on messaging that will, you know, happen during the pediatric visit around um, families and technology use. So through surveys, they learned that families want more information and guidance um, from pediatricians around, you know, what to do, what not to do, but that it often doesn't come up in the pediatric visit and that they struggle to ask those sorts of questions. And so um, families are gonna develop the messages based on what they think would be resonant for them. Um, and it's gonna be piloted in uh, a number of clinics with pediatricians and then um, hopefully rolled out more broadly once those messages are tested. Mm -hmm. Deborah, I see you unmuting. Were you about to add something? Well, yes, I would say that, you know, aside from the modality of how young people are reading, we have to remember that even though there's wide distribution of electronic devices, that there's not an equity of access to broadband um, or software or the funds to underwrite access to eBooks, for example, and not, and it is a real effort on the part of libraries to make sure that people understand that they can access ebooks through libraries, but not every book is licensed as an ebook as well. Um, and so there still are significant barriers that exist, particularly for those who are low income or lack housing um, or are second language or third language that, that makes it difficult to use that as a solution for access to diverse books, at least from the library perspective. As much as the work that we're doing uh, across with policy on broadband access, we have to remember that you know electronic access, bookstores are one part of the solution, but they're not a total solution. We can't rely on them alone. Sarah. Go ahead, please go ahead. Marla. We have been pretty agnostic into the method. What we want is literacy rich environments and be it tools that can be used in the classroom to help support literacy. You know, we've supported audio books for families who have low literacy level and still want to engage with their children. We've done digital platforms. We've done books. We've done writing and literacy courses for, you know, early childhood. For us, we rather flood the system with a variety of mechanisms so that families can use whatever works best for them. What we don't want is for there to be an absence of tools and resources and access to literacy rich environments. Wonderful. Anything that you would add and Melanie? So I'll say, I think, you know, as Deborah mentioned, and especially in West Virginia, broadband is a, is a major issue for us, right? And so a lot of our study, strategies have been focused on like physical hard copies and access to physical hard copies of books. Um, and so we have like the Dolly Parton Reading Imagination Library, right? So that's something that we've supported over time because it's another medium and method to get books into the hands of kids. Um, however, a lot of our initiatives and projects have been just trying to access um, literacy in a multitude of ways. And so we're, we are seeing some variety in terms of kind of like digital access uh, across projects, but it really comes down to the locale and in terms of access to things like broadband or other barriers. Um, and so much like Carla, our, our goal is just to make sure that 
um, students have access to the text in whatever medium works best for them. But a lot of our focus has been more on the hard copy print. Yes, yeah, certainly with the pandemic and the shift to virtual learning, every became everyone became much more aware of the differences in access to broadband and um, digital learning opportunities. So that also is an issue here. Um, another question that we had come in was um, asking, you know, how are you all conceiving of diversity beyond the frequency of representation to take into account the complexity of that representation? Um, in there, in this uh, question, Asker's work, we've seen diversity or in seen increased diversity in representation, but many of times, many of those examples are still quite limiting, negative or superficial, reinforcing kind of that single story narratives. So in thinking about the diversity of the content in books, how are you all kind of um, understanding kind of the, the quality of the diverse books, if that makes sense? I, I'll, I'll jump in here first and just say, so while we don't have oversight, so full transparency, we do not have oversight of um, the narratives that are displayed within the text um, from our conversations and engagement with our, our partners on the ground, there is an intentional focus to ensure that we have positive representation of all people, right? And so I think for us, because we recognize that that presence isn't always visible through a multitude of mediums, um, when we're working with local school districts, either when we're working with the, the Department of Ed, there is an intentionality in our conversations about the fact that these books should be inclusive of positive stories and narratives. And now this isn't to get away from things like historical context and understanding, you know, the history of the, the place and, and time in which um, we exist, but it also is to acknowledge that um, there's a multitude of ways in which we in, as individuals that engage and interact with the world. And that should be represented, especially in a very positive light for um, historically marginalized populations, which do not tend to have that representation equally in the text that we see. And so um, I can say that there is the intentionality in terms of our engagement with our partners about sharing that upfront is the expectation. Um, but we do work with a lot of school systems that have are very well versed in a process for identifying and selecting text to support curricular outcomes for students. Anyone else want to chime in on that? This question goes, um, kind of gets to a little bit of kind of the ecosystem in terms of the educators um, that are working to engage children with books and ensure that they have access to diverse books. Um, question asking, what supports are you all providing for teachers in the classroom to deal with the political climate that we were discussing a bit ago? Speaking from this person's personal experience, feel confident in my ability to teach children to read. I'm well versed in the science of reading. I understand the importance of diverse books and I'm able to find resources to include them in um, their classroom. All that being said, I live in Florida and I have no intention of risking my teaching license if a parent takes umbrage with a book in my classroom. What can be done to support teachers in ways that they can't support themselves in this moment in time when there is the threat of being fired or losing, you know, your job and to defend diverse books. I'll try to tackle that yeah. because there's really two ways and we're working uh, on, on both paths. And the first of course is legal challenges that attack the idea that school boards can engage in content and viewpoint discrimination um, that is in itself discriminatory in its intent, such as Florida's don't say gay law, the anti-CRT bills that we've seen pass that bar access to particular topics and uh, ideas in K through 12 schools. And it's also reaching higher education in Florida as well. 
And so I can assure you that there are a number of legal initiatives either in process or already in the courts to challenge those laws on a First Amendment and 14th Amendment basis. But the courts grind exceedingly slow. It's not an immediate solution. So the other solution is supporting local advocacy, gathering support for educators, for librarians, school librarians at the local level, forming community groups. And that's where we see Unite Against Book Bans, our national partnership coming into play, providing tools at, to individuals, strengthening their resolve, giving them talking points, uh, things as simple as candidate questionnaires or providing candidates with a pledge to sign. Not that we endorse particular candidates, but allowing individuals to come to understand where candidates stand so that then they do form grassroots advocacy groups to support educators and librarians that they know who's standing for election or to put up candidates who are in support of providing uh, diverse materials to individuals to not limiting in students. You know, we, you know, and it's not going to be an easy path or short path to push back against these initiatives. Um, but the the resources are there, the organizations are there. I think of Florida Freedom to Read, for example, and the superb work they're doing to bring light to some of the censorship attempts there uh, and, and to support local educators. FTRF, um, ALA, we also have an organization called Merit Fund, in addition to United Against Book Bans. We all have different pieces to play to support educators and librarians undergoing individual attacks, as well as a going after policy initiatives that have been so harmful in those uh, ways, you know. And so, um, you know, it's just digging in and realizing that in addition to promoting the books, we have to engage in advocacy on a multitude of fronts to support individuals. And even doing something as simple as if you're aware of a challenge, uh, a controversy in your community that centers a librarian or a teacher to reach out to that librarian and teacher and know that they have support from at least one individual in the community. It can make a huge difference. You know, building on that, your response just then, Deborah, um, someone else was asking if there, like, what happened? So, um, reaching out to a librarian or a teacher that has been challenged or experienced a challenge. Uh, Alan Gutman was asking like, what what else can I do maybe as a person in a community? Is there like a, an alert line? How do we mm -hmm. um, let you well, know when there is a challenge? I'm sure everyone here has different modalities to reach out to supporters and interested persons. From our perspective, if you sign up for Unite Against Book Bans, we do send out alerts when we know that there is a board meeting uh, or a controversy where local support is needed. We've successfully organized groups in support of librarians and educators in Texas, Louisiana. Uh, we have done some work in Florida, um, but also supporting the organizations that support educators and librarians. You're, you know, the local professional association, whether that's a union or otherwise. Um, we, you know, American Association of School Librarians, um, my Office for Intellectual Freedom, we actually work one on one with individual educators and librarians who ask us for help when we do that confidentially. And sometimes the most we can do is emotional support, but we make sure that it's there for them. We also ask people across what I would, we call it the library ecosystem, but I think it's really the book ecosystem, is being willing to go to the board meetings and speak up and take a stand to speak to your local community groups, your church groups, to push back against this narrative that books are harmful in some way to young people. You know, I, I will just say it in that we, we're seeing so much effort to keep guns in the hands of people, but so much effort to keep using legal means to keep books out of the hands of young people. And we need to, as a community, as advocates, as, you know, individuals speak out, let our elected officials know, let our boards know, and be present um, in these controversies. That's one of the biggest challenges we face. We know we have this broad support. Activating that support falls on each of us as individuals to step up and speak out. 
Yeah, I would add based on just the community engagement strategy that we use in the foundation, we always say, tell folks, educate yourself, understand what's happening in your local community, who are the leading organizations working on the issues that mean something to you, and then how are you actively participating with your time and your networks to help support those organizations. And because we believe that all change happens in community and that it's at the local level that we'll see significant change. And so we just encourage folks to become active participants in what's happening in their local community. Thank you, Carla. That's where we're seeing it is where school boards are saying, no, we won't take these books out of the hands of students. We won't take these books out of the curriculum when they have sufficient support from community members speaking out against that kind of book removal in their communities. So it is all at the local level. You know, Sarah, we have a question that I think speaks to the, the genuine concerns and fears people have and maybe speaks to that kind of listening and framing that uh, we were talking about. So it's an, an anonymous attendee who says, I think reading about all kinds of cultures is wonderful. My only concern is if the books you advocate for are screened so that it is proven that their content is age appropriate so they don't expose our innocent children to sexually explicit material and at the same time respect their parents' cultural backgrounds. Um, you're gonna get these kinds of questions. It's a wondering and it's a fear that when you say diverse books, you mean something different. So could you kind of help that person understand what you really mean? Well, when I talk about diverse books, it's an understanding that the books that are available in children, you know, from a library perspective, the books that are available in a children's room are different from books that are in a young adult collection that are different than the books in adult collection. And often we see a lot of misinformation and disinformation that books that are intended for young adults or adult readers are in the hands of very young readers. And that's simply not the case. Um, librarians are dedicated to the idea of matching the book to the reader matching their development, their understanding, respecting the cultural background of the reader as well. And, you know, but ultimately, when you look at public libraries, for example, they are organizations that serve an entire community, that serve everyone in the community. And so librarians are anxious to work in partnership with parents to make sure that they're finding the resources they need, but they can't guarantee that you won't necessarily see a book that doesn't match your family's values or needs displayed on a shelf, but that's there for another reader, for another family. And we have to foster this understanding that not everything is going to match what we believe or what, but it's there for someone else. Um, so, you know, and certainly, you know, I would recommend thinking carefully about a book that does reflect the lives and experiences of someone dealing with gender identity in a book that's intended for older adolescents, for adult readers, is something that is something that is inappropriate to be in the library. It's there for a particular reader. It's not there for everyone. And certainly librarians are there to work with you to identify the resources that will fit your family's values and needs. We need to understand that these works are need to be available for those for educational purposes, for understanding um, and understanding that not all the narratives that you're seeing in headlines about these books is actually accurate or true. I just want to thank our anonymous um, attendee for posing the question, but also to, to Deb and the panelists for helping them understand. I think this is part of our listening, framing, helping people understand what you're really saying. We get into a lot of jargon and we don't know what's in other people's heads and what they're thinking. So the more we can explain uh, and uh, and listen and uh, and respect the, the question, I think the better we'll be. Just wanted to get that question out. Thank yeah. you. And, and Jacqueline, I did want to tag on to there to remember that teachers and librarians are highly trained professionals that work under policies that guide them in developing curriculum, that guide them in selecting books that are developmentally appropriate for the intended audience. And that it's not a haphazard process or a political process. And again, pushing back against some narratives that have been floated out there that are inaccurate and true. I think that what you're seeing in this webinar today 
is far more accurate reflection of the work that's being done in this area than something that you've seen in uh, you know sensation seeking headlines right now. Um, one more question, um, and this one might be good for you, Jen, um, but maybe others might be have something to share. Uh, Kelly Sharkey is asking for ideas and resources to help identify book deserts in a particular area, which is very much what I know you all did in Philadelphia to identify North Philly was had less access to books as a part of your research. Um, any additional kind of resource or insights that you could share based upon those experiences and others as well? Um, certainly, if you connect with me afterwards, I can share the um, quarterly survey questions that um, Read by Fourth um, shares with its partners to get at those questions about where are books currently being distributed in the city. Um, you know, most of our knowledge about that issue has come from from that. Um, but, you know, without a table like Home Libraries Work Group, you know, I could see an organization just talking with two organizations um, in their community that serve families and um, asking them or asking them to ask their families, like, how many books do they have in the home? How are they using those books? Um, where are they getting their books? Um, are they purchasing them? Are they getting them like through scholastic readers at school? Or are they taking them from the library? But trying to get a holistic sense of where books are coming from. Are they getting into homes? How families are using them? Um, you know, at this point, I think we've dialed into why parents are or children are choosing particular books, what is attractive to them. Um, and so there's a lot of ways to dig into this, but it's best to go to the source, which is the organizations that are either distributing books or serving families um, who are consuming books in your communities. Um, and so it seems like other people might be interested in getting access to that survey. So maybe if we could get the survey questions, we could include that as one of the resources in the follow-up email that we send out um, later on this week. And also just wanted to flag for everybody um, joining us that we posted our um, uh, evaluation survey poll just a couple moments ago and would encourage you all to take just a quick second um, to share your thoughts and feedback um, with us on that. Well, we'll continue the conversation. One more question before we move on to the closing, just any kind of Closing thoughts from each of you in terms of advice that you might offer up to um, other funders who are listening in, community partners that are inspired by all of the that you've shared today and would like to take action. Um, so any additional kind of thoughts and advice beyond what you've shared already? Um, I mean, I can start. I think all things start locally. And so for local funding funders, community foundations, really, you know, talking to community members around what is it that they want and the sorts of supports that they need, and then making available the resources and building the networks that are necessary to get them there. I think thinking about it from a systemic way. So thinking about both in our public systems, our local community systems, thinking about it in classrooms, thinking about it in homes, finding different mechanisms to support literacy, regardless of where it is, based on what your foundation has as their main mission, there's room for all of us. We will never turn anyone away. So come to the table and find the space. And then I also think that it's really important to fund coalitions and to do it through general operating and multi-year funding. I think we can't continue to do one-year funding around a specific project because the world is so dynamic and there's so many different things coming on and we want folks to be able to pivot in real time and bring in lessons learned as they're thinking about creating literacy-rich environments. And so encouraging other funders to think about it differently than we may have done in the past and really opening up the ideas and the funding pools for innovation. Thank you. Who wants to go next? I, I can go next. Um, so this may seem similar, but I think for us and, and just thinking about reflecting on this process, um, 
we were intentional about starting small, right? So our, our goal is, of course, we want every child in West Virginia in our service area and in Southwestern PA to have access to diverse books. Um, but we also recognize that we couldn't go big too fast and we had to be really intentional about it. And so we were thinking about how do we just begin to raise local awareness, to just engage in, in a pilot a way to begin to, to show proof of concept that would allow us to think about scaling and then eventually getting to a, a policy level um, position. And so I think that sometimes when we're so focused on wanting to do everything and be everything for everyone, we have to find a starting point. And for us, we were able to find a starting point with folks who were equally invested and interested and were champions. And we knew we're going to champion this work long-term um, was really important. And then we could use that to, to cultivate and galvanize other folks to support this work. And now we're starting to see requests for um, this type of programming in the other counties that we serve, right? And we can't jump at them all at once because there's still some infrastructure pieces that have to be in place for us to be successful. But I think it's okay to start small, right? I think it's okay to start small and, and continue to think about how do you grow that into something that could be more systemic. Great point and advice because there's so much you can do and that can be for me. Uh, yeah. I, I would only echo both Carla and Melanie's advice here, particularly the idea that this is really something that has to be rooted in local initiatives. But I would also say there's a role for everyone here. And you may need to take a moment or two to discover what that role is, but we need all hands on deck with this initiative, whatever it is, supporting literacy, supporting access, um, distribution, um, solving issues as simple as, you know, universally available broadband access um, that would enable so many families to have access to resources that they don't otherwise have access to. Um, so I just say, find your role and, and jump in with both feet. And there are coalitions, there are partnerships you can join to learn more, to participate, uh, to find your great, you know, find that place that you have in this initiative. I would just echo what Carla said of listening to a community, making sure your investments are aligned with what's actually needed and happening and also this idea of longer term investment so that you build in that ability for flexibility and for learning and improvement as, as grants go on. Great, thank you. Um, well, huge thank you to all of our panelists today, to Deborah caldwell Soane, to Melanie Claxton, Jennifer Stavrakis, and Carla Thompson-Payton um, for joining us to share all of these great insights and actionable um, ideas and suggestions. And huge thanks to Jacqueline Jones for joining us again to moderate today's conversation and really elicit all of these ideas and feedback. Um, I hope that all of you who joined the conversation found it as um, insightful and inspiring as I did. And I hope you'll continue to join us for future sessions. I will bring up the screen with those in just a second. I um, hope you'll uh, register, make plans to join us for a conversation later on today um, focused on student retention and how we can all ensure that children um, receive all the supports learning opportunities they need from birth through the end of third grade so that they can um, transition successfully into fourth grade um, and read to learn throughout life. Um, and future sessions every single Tuesday at three o'clock. Also hope you'll join us for next, um, next month's Funder to Funder conversation, which will return again to the idea of um, kindergarten as a sturdy bridge between the early years and early grades, looking at place-based investments in that area. Um, thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to all of our attendees. Um, hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care.